So Max Lawton here today is a translator, novelist, and musician. He received his BA in Russian literature and culture from Columbia um, and his MPhil from Queens College, Oxford, where he wrote a dissertation comparing Celine and Dostoevsky that, I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call on my office phone that I just can't stop it. I'm so sorry, excuse me. Now it is off the hook. I am so sorry. Excuse me for that. I, I don't really use the phone and stuff. Anyway, Max is the author of a novel that is currently waiting, awaiting publication and is writing his doctoral dissertation on phenomenology and the 20th century novel um, at Columbia University, where he also teaches Russian. And he has also translated many books by Vladimir Sorokin, which is why we are here today. The fruits of that labor are just beginning to appear in print. Several of his stories have showed up in some journals, including The New Yorker and N Plus One, and students who've registered for this event will get a free copy of N Plus One. I'll be in touch about that. I have them here in my office with Max's story, uh, Max's translation of Sarokin's story, Horse Soup. Um, the novel, Therefore Hearts, is coming out from Dalkey Ar Archive Press in April and Telluria later in the summer and many more novels, six, I believe, um, after that in the next few years. So it's a really big and really exciting project. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about it and to hear some of these translations as well. So I'm gonna turn things over to Max. He's going to read some stories and then talk a little bit about how this all came to be. Um, and then we'll open up for discussion and here we go, to you. Well, Alan, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, I guess what I thought I was going to do and I think I'm still going to do is just launch right in with a crazy reading of two stories. Um, that is a, sort of a funny way to get started because it's so full on, but uh, I think it's probably the only way to go. So these two stories come from Sarokin's early correction called Pirvi Subotnik. They've been rearranged into this new collection, which we uh, just based on the vagaries of the publishing world, you can't really keep short story collections intact. It's uh, unfortunate, but true because, you know, we've sold two, maybe sell three, doing more than that would be, uh, people just don't buy that many short stories, even though Sorokin short stories are some of his strongest, uh, strongest stuff. So these two stories come from his early collection, Pirvi Subotnik. They're binary bombs is what we refer to them as because they start out with a very banal, uh, even boring Soviet situation, which they outline without really much deviation from the norm, so to speak. Then something goes wrong and they uh, descend into the world of apparent violence, gibberish, and uh, I don't know, meaninglessness. So I'm gonna read two of them that are very short. The first one is called A Competition. It's about two guys in rural Russia, it's never specified quite where, um, who are having a contest with another group of guys to see who can fell more trees for a mill. Um, and then the second story is a monologue where a man tries to tell to, an older man tries to tell two younger people about the meaning of love. But uh, let's start with A Competition. <clears throat> Loh have turned off the chainsaw and put it down on a fresh stump. They're taking down the third plot and they got what's his name with them? Vaska from uh, Znamenskaya. Mihailchev? Budziuk asked, kicking away a thick pine branch with his boots. That one. And it's obvious who got him started. Salomkin. The guys told me yesterday in the office they had a Komsomol meeting and well, Salomkin got to speaking. We, he says, have always been behind Budziuk's team. And now we'll kill ourselves if we have to, but we're gonna be first. And that's how it started. I was just walking over and there set up like Stahanovites, felon without season. Budziuk sighed and wiped his resin stained palm on his sleeve. Yeah, Salomkin, he's a feisty character. I know, he'll get him going all right. But the others too, you know, it's like they've been selected all special. Second only to the army. 
they got balls to spare. Wajuk nodded silently. Two hawks hovered over the clearing. Lohav took off his cap and wiped at his sweaty brow. I wanted to say even earlier. Yeah, you know, somehow. What? Well, I don't know. Wajuk laughed. What? You get scared or something? Nah, nah, I just didn't want to do it in front of the guys. Let them find out for themselves in the office. Wujuk brushed the sawdust from his pants. And win doesn't really matter, does it? And what is this even? So they challenged us to a competition. So what? Lohav scratched at his cheek. Maybe they can compete with Vas Vasnitovsky's team, huh? Wujuk looked at him mockingly. You chicken out or something? Nah, nah, it's just that I'm getting up there in the years. I'm all plowed, plowed out, and so are you. Bujuk shook his head. Oh, yeah, look how quickly you back down. And here I am, Ivan Lexage, like family to you, having had my fill in plowing in this life no less than you. But I don't want to give up first place in the pennant to Solomkin squad. Our guys are going to be back in a moment, and I'll tell them that we're going to compete. We got to. Squinting, Lohav looked up at the cawing hawks. Wajuk set his foot in its tarpaulin boots atop a fallen pine tree. And can it really be you got no simple human pride, Van? They're young punks, green as green can be. What do you think? We ain't got enough strength? My Jorka is worth three of theirs. And Petrov and Sonia, ah, uh, we'll win this competition in no time, and that's a fact. They got no clue what a forest even is, and they still think they'll win. No way. Their pants are going to burst. Lohav smiled. Well, that's one way of putting it. There they are, the stragglers. God be with them. Let them straggle. We'll take them with dexterity instead of impudence. I'm not against it, of course. What do we need the pennant for, though? We'll get, we'll get a bonus no matter what. More pay for more work, too. Bujuk waved his hand. You're no fun, Vanya. A born lumberjack. He lifted up his chainsaw touched the suction valve and pulled the cord. The saw rattled and exuded blue and white smoke. He shifted his grip and carried it over to the pines. Lohav stood up reluctantly. Maybe we should wait for the guys, San. Bujuk kept walking without turning around. Lohav started up his saw. One of the hawks folded its wings and dove down. Bujuk reached a pine tree, quickly hewed a groove into it, walked around to its other side, then laid chain to nobbled trunk. The chainsaw purred and yellowish sawdust poured down onto his boots. The blade slowly entered the tree. Bujuk pressed on it lightly. Lohav walked over with his rattling saw and set to work on the neighboring pine. Bujuk's pine trembled and creaked. He stepped back and shifted his grip. The pine swayed and began to fall. Its long trunk bent and fell to the ground with a crash. Fell it toward the middle, Bujuk shouted to Lohav, and completely bent over, Lohav nodded. Bujuk walked over to the other pine tree, measured it up, looked around, made his approach from the necessary side and began to hew out a groove. Lohav walked away from his tree. His pine tumbled down onto, onto the one that, it, that had just fallen. Now we'll knock down the hut of branches and not touch the trees on the left. We'll have to fell them into the ravine over yonder, Wujuk shouted at him. The saw in Lohav's hand sneezed and stopped. What's going on, Wujuk shouted, approaching the trunk of his tree from the other side. This model's real old, it's Andrei's Druzhba. You gotta get rid of it. Wujuk turned away, leaning against the handle of his saw more forcefully. Lohav shook the suction valve, wound the cord, and hauled on it. The saw rattled, then fell silent. Ah, uh, you little. He started to wind up the cord again. Lohav started his chainsaw, spat, and stepping over a trunk, looked at the pine standing nearby. Not one of them's crooked, like they'd been selected all special for us. Wudzuk cut away a bush next to a pine. Let me help you, San, Lohav shouted shuffled over toward him. Better you should go over there and fell or, you know, cut away those branches. Damn, it's overgrown. Can't get through. Willow bush. It's just the order of things, Lohav shouted, standing right next to him. 
He pressed the throttle more tightly to the handle, quickly parried the chainsaw to the left, and thrust the blade into Buzuk's neck. Buzuk was still bent over. Dark blood flew forth from under the toothed chain, and his head, together with his shabby cap, separated from his neck, then tumbled down into the bushes. Buzuk's legs buckled, and his saw crashed to the ground. He fell onto it, his legs kicking. Lohav looked around, pulled the chainsaw out from under the headless body, grabbed his own two, and set off running, dragging both along the ground and dodging their oblong chains as he went. His hands depressed the throttles to the grips, the saws roared, and bluish plumes of exhaust trailed behind him. Now we gon' compete. We gon' compete, mumbled Lohav, making a wide berth around the stumps. He ran through the clearing, crossed the ravine, and ended up atop a precipice. The Sosha flowed unhurriedly down below, and three guys were sitting on a footbridge and fishing. Noticing Lohav with the roaring saws in hand, they raised themselves up slightly. Whoa, Uncle Vanya's got like two of them, and they're so loud. Hey, you ain't seen my old man, have you, Uncle Von? Lohav whistled. One of the chains made contact with his leg, and he shuddered. The kids were watching him intently. Now we gon' compete, mumbled Lohav, set off at a run, then hurled himself into the water together with the saws. One of the boys dropped his rod, jumped up, and making a complex motion through the air, fell to the ground. The other two ran over to him, lifted him up in their outstretched arms, and whistled. One of them vomited onto the recumbent boy's head. A spasm passed through the other boy's body, and he kicked the third boy in the stomach. The third boy clacked his teeth together, rolled his eyes, and began to speak. And this was when he'll go to the market. He'll buy some fatty lard, and at home they'll hew a little pyramid out of him, and they'll cut a gut out of her, and he'll go to the hospital and buy eight extracted purulent appendixes from the surgeon. And from them, we'll release pus at the pyramid. He'll seal it over with a lardy lid. Yeah, and he'll sew it up afterward. He'll boil the little pyramid in goat milk to the count of five and he'll carry it out onto the frost. And he'll find the salty seaman himself and he'll show the pit to the secret member and let it tumble off at the brown cottage cheese into the smallish pitcher. Yes, and in the cellar to the godfather and himself to the she-wolf in the upper chamber, he'll enter, he'll open, he'll call the paraclet. He'll call the little bros and let him count the crowns. And the third from the paraclet, the lumber will get pulled at it, and he and the she-wolf will go to the banya, and there her womb will get pulled out, and afterwards she'll run to her sister-in-law and attach the breadish rag to the womb, apply it, and wipe away the separation. And Vasily and the father will carry off the coffin from her upper chamber out into the yard. And there, already got all gathered by the coffin, Matriona and lies on down, and the salty sailors and Vasily will rub the coffin on over with lard and he'll bow down, and he'll step away with the world, and when they begin to turn well and let him, let him, let us down onto the gold barren tiger-like, tiger-like expanses of our trembling and shuddering souls, let us, let us, let us spread forth our light carrying marble wings, our extinguish, extinguish, extinguish the black flames of non-incarnate illuminators, scatter, scatter, scatter the fragments of the trampled idols, lead, lead, lead the blonde babes through the marble labyrinth of death, Speak, speak, speak about the decay of eternity with the, with the silver-visaged elders. Understand, understand, understand the laws of force of the kingdoms and the thrones. Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle the exuded shadows of that which is past. Embrace, embrace, embrace the trunks of forbidden oaks and lindens. Encroach, encroach, encroach upon the mysterious lacunae and the obvious bodies. Carry off, carry off, carry off the platinum tablets into the palaces a formidable finery, deny, deny, deny past participation in games of confusion and apostasy. Raise up, raise up, raise up the velvet covers. I'm also not of enough of a fool to trust people from Kostroma. When they slipped me the ones that had been written off, I jingled the earring right away. He told Adashkin and he told me and I slipped it in. And then about the funds at that point in his career, once to him, he says in the third quarter, and I say, if it's gonna be the third, That'll be making concrete out of a screw. And he said to Canton and says the district committee is pressing him. And he's not trying to just swoop in with his party membership card. And we went out into the courtyard with the little pyramid against the pale sheet. We put it onto the sad hack log and Vasily Petrovich drew back his sorrowful ax and cut it right in two. After that, he straightened up, wiped away a tear with trembling finger, was silent for a moment, then pronounced in a quiet, slightly hoarse voice, 
pus and lard. That was the first one. <laughs> um, and we'll do one more, which as I said, uh, this one is a little bit less contextualized other than sort of typical Soviet elder advice about love hmm. that goes, well, <clears throat> a little wrong. No, my friends, no, no, and no again. Even though you're young, blushes still play across your cheeks like juicy apples and your jeans are tattered and your voices resound all the same. To love like Stepan Ilyich Marozov loved his Valentina, you'll never be capable of that. And don't argue with me. Don't shake your lit cigarettes in my face and don't interrupt me. Better to just listen to the old man and take notes. This was a long time ago. I was even younger than you and I didn't have jeans or a tape recorder, or a fashionable watch. I only had a homespun shirt tarpaulin boots smeared over in lard and a knapsack. And in it was a crust of bread and nothing more. But I had strength and a youngin's health and a desire to prove myself to the people, to go study. And then having completed my studies to build steamers and take people all around the entire world on those very same steamers. And I went to the city to apply to technical school. I was a capable guy. I grasped everything on the fly. Even though those were hungry times and I ate only when I had to, I still graduated from our rural school with honors. And my teacher, Natalia Kalistratovna, since deceased, gave me a diploma and a letter of recommendation together with it, addressed to the dean of a um, technical school. And in the letter, she wrote that I was a, a capable fellow, that I had a particular inclination for math and physics, that I knew geometry well. And the main thing, that I love to tinker with things various and sundry, such as uh, sticky weather vanes covered over in bells and rattles, <laughs> ships with masts and sails, self-propelled strollers that uh, ran on steam, and much else. I mean, that's what a good woman she was. I went to the city and headed for the Dean straight away. He was a really tall guy and uh, personable too. He came over to me from behind his desk, tugged down his military smock and asked who I was and what I was there for. Well, I explain everything in detail and present the diploma and, and letter. He looked at the diploma, read the letter and smiled. Okay, he says, Victor Froloff, here's a referral for a dormitory and another for the exams, even though they ended a, a little while back. But don't worry, we'll make an exception for you if you're so capable. You'll study with us. And as for work, you... Three about two pages of ellipses. Grabbed it and carried it over to me. And I'm standing there, neither dead nor alive. I don't know what to do. And he screams out in a voice that's not his own, start the engine. And his eyes fill right up with fire like two steamship furnaces. And I rush over to the switch, flip it, and the gear set to grinding and just spin and spin and spin and spin. Our engine was working, the connecting rods with the flywheels had come round, and oh, how they sparkled with their oil in the sun. He points to the levers and shouts out even louder over the sound of the engine. The right one, he shouts, pull the right one, you mother lover. And he's just trembling all over. I grabbed the lever and pulled it off to the side. The right one set to humming, sneezed out blue smoke, caster set to running, yeah, and, and pulleys and polished rollers too. I, I pressed myself against the wall. It's shaking me. There's no way I can stop it. I, I can't even rest my top teeth on my bottom. And Stepan Ilyich rushed over to the right one and the ring, grab it, grab it. He turned it, opened the pallet and gave it a kick. A first, a second and a third. The lid flew off and almost biffed me. Then he kicks the other, another and another and another. The other one flew off too. And they're, they're knocking up top asking, What's that sound you got going on down there? And I'm standing there all white, my knees trembling and my arms hanging down at my side like, like limp whips. I'm standing and watching as if I were paralyzed. And there, that means he broke off the lids. He ran over to the table, raked up Valentina with his hands. Oh, and how he dashes her down onto the pallets. Oh, mama, how he does it. 
a crunch and a squelch. Blood and engine oil in every direction, but he doesn't look away. He ran over to the shelf and he takes that very same ear from the top. It's wrapped in a rag. He takes it, unwraps it, brings it to his lips and speaks with tears in his eyes. Forgive me, he says. Forgive me and don't blame me for nothing. And after that, he grabs the bottle of sperm and knocks it over my skull. Boom, it's shattered and oh, how the sperm flowed over me. And he tucked the ear into his shirt, broke the window with a stool, then threw himself down from the eighth floor. Humpty dumpty himself. And I spent the, a month in the hospital with a concussion. Then I quit. And you young people still say Beatrice, Beatrice, Dante. That is it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, with that weird introduction, I guess I thought I'd just maybe in before questions talk a little bit about how the project got started and sort of what my goals are and, uh, and how I work. Um, so essentially um, what I think Bear is mentioning is that, uh, well, I'll just tell the story, I guess, from the beginning. So right out of college, I was really sort of, didn't understand why Sorokin hadn't been translated. When I was getting into the study of Russian literature as an undergrad at Columbia, I obviously loved Dostoevsky as everyone does, but I, I really wanted to read Sorokin and I'd read uh, Blue Lard, his famous novel in French. And I read Rahman in French as well. And I, but a lot of it's just not translated in any other language. So I was always thinking about that in college, but as anyone who's done a four year degree in Russian literature knows, you're not actually but you're pretty good at it at the end, but you're not that good. So it was always this sort of like thing just beyond my reach. And eventually I decided to start translating um, Blue Lard, crazy idea. My, my first year at Oxford, I translated about, um, I guess a hundred pages in the printed volume. So like 30,000 words, maybe 35. And I got Sorokin's email and sent it to him and uh, we started to work together. And um, I just, it was sort of the, the motivation I needed to continue to pursue my Russian studies. And, uh, you know, I went to Middlebury, where actually Helen and I went to the Middlebury Russian school together one summer. And, um, and uh, it was just sort of this giant project, which I think I was lucky to not really know how this stuff was supposed to work because it allowed me to do it the wrong way, which worked out in the end. Uh, because I translated, I actually have done most of the translations that are getting published already because I just work with him, not all of them, but I think a lot of them. So essentially I did the Blue Lord, Therefore Hearts to, and Telluria and the short stories before anything got published. And we were just shopping completed translated novels around to publishers, which uh, is not <laughs> how it's normally done. But um, I think it worked in the end. And especially with Sarokin, when you're so dependent on if you're giving a book that if an editor is giving a book they can't read to a uh to a reader they're very dependent on the report uh which for a writer like Sarokin who you've just heard and maybe you've read Sarokin before can be very strange and divisive the the reader's report could not be favorable or could highlight the wrong things so it's really important for the editors to really be able to read the text and not a great many editors can read Russian uh, in the in America, at least. Um, so uh, Will Evans is a big exception, I should say, because this is being <laughs> recorded. But Will Will does read Russian. He's he he was ready for the pitch when I when I came with it, uh, and he didn't technically need the translated versions. Um, and so yeah, I think it was just sort of. I mean, the fact that Blue Lard, the fact that it took twenty years for Blue Lard to get translated is is really uh, crazy. Because I think that's sort of a famous book to people who read in the sense that they know what it is, they've heard about it. Uh, a vast swath of uh, book people know about the Rushov Stalin sex scene and the, the toilet in front of the Bolshoi and really want to read that book. And then I think, you know, they, they sort of are aware of Sorokin as a figure and, and want to read more. So I think I was lucky to know not know how to do it and do it the wrong way and then have a lot of luck in terms of who, who I got in touch with. Um, working with Mark Croder, the Den Plus One, 
who published uh, White Square in late 2019 or early 2020, which was a big boost. And then Horse Soup and the New Yorker thing. And then everything just kind of, it's like dominoes. Once you get enough momentum, everything starts to fall down. Um, but as for the work itself, I think my goal is, um, as you may be heard, to, to render it in comparable American idi idioms um, and to make it sort of snap, crackle, and pop in the same way that Sorokin's language does. His work is all about textures. It's all about styles. And if you're not uh, rendering it in, in stylized fashion, then I think you're not succeeding because that the whole point when you read Sorokin it just in Russian you're struck by the stylistic uh variations you're struck by these various diremptions you're stuck by these sorts of ruptures so I think you have to be a little bit bold and I think that's I'm really grateful for being able to have worked with uh Vladimir for that reason because we uh, sort of have a, an open dialogue and um we uh go back and forth a lot about different ways to possibly do things. And, um, and uh, I think for, there are some examples of chapters in Telluria, which you'll soon see when it comes out. Uh, I really did take big risks. And I think this is an interesting thing we thought about a lot because in a novel like Blue Lord, the second half takes place in the Soviet Union and really parodies Soviet language, a lot like Norma, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Norm, his first novel, which is a total deconstruction of Soviet language. And when you're dealing with a novel like that, actually it's much more difficult because you have to maintain a degree of fidelity to the fact that this language that's being dealt with actually comes from somewhere and actually has a sort of concrete set of attachments and meanings. But when you, in a text like Telluria, which is a, essentially a fantasy novel, it's sort of like, I don't know, a geopolitical fantasy novel, um, I guess. Um, you can, I think, be a bit bolder in the sorts of choices you make. And so some of the departures there were pretty fun. And um, there's a chapter that in the original is like a centaur who speaks in a sort of fake version of Old Church Slavonic. And so we uh, rendered that in uh, Old English, but not real Old English. So, but obviously I don't, I can't write in Old English, but it's just sort of the joke and you can't make the equivalent puns. Um, with Rahman, the one I'm working on now, it's a giant binary bomb where it's um, about 400 pages. It's his longest novel. It's about 400 pages of just a pastiche of a Russian novel, like a 19th century Russian novel with no wink whatsoever. And so um, the, the, the issue with this is what is our conception of a Russian novel in English? And of course, our conception of the Russian novel in English probably comes from translation itself. So I, I, I gathered a stack of uh, translated classics and slightly out, outdated translations and read them and just highlighted expressions I wanted to copy and paste into the, into the first half of Raman. So I've done a lot of stuff like that where I think it's not a word for word translation, but it's truer to the spirit of the thing than if you were to do that. Uh, I also copy and pasted some expressions like that into the book, uh, into the Dostoevsky and Tolstoy clone texts and Blue Lard. I, um, another, actually this is a very interesting test case because as everyone knows who has read about Blue Lard, the um, parodies are sort of a point of contention among critics because the clone texts are, so for those of you who don't know, the plot is that, um, these genetic engineers who work for the Russian government in the near future um, clone a bunch of Russian writers and get them to undergo, undergo a script process because this, in the course of this script process, blue lard is produced in the smalls of their backs. And um, what the Russian government or the organization these scientists are working for, it's never quite explained, want to do with it is build nuclear reactors on the moon. However, uh, it gets stolen by an organization called the Earth Fuckers, who then uh, take it back in time to an alternate version of the Soviet Union. So very wild plot, but the point is that that's how the clone texts get produced. And the texts are not actually parodies per se. A lot of the texts don't really resemble the, um, the, the writer they're parodying. For example, Pasternak's text, if you'll forgive the vulgarity, it's just called pizda, and it's not really, it's not uh, rendered in the style of Pasternak. It's just sort of a 
desecration, but um, there are other ones that are more complicated. Like the Nabokov text is not in any way, shape, or form in a in a in a, in a, in a sort of idiom of, or a, ver, a ver, version of Nabokov style. But it, what Sorokin told me is it's a it's essence capturing. So we can imagine why there might be a difference between essence capturing and, and parody, because parody would have to focus on the external characteristics a lot. And essence capturing would be sort of the heart of the thing. So that's an interesting conundrum for a translator, because with the Dostoevsky and Tolstoy parodies, they came off pretty easily. But we also have an English language Nabokov. And so someone who's read Lolita and Ada and Panin and Ben Sinister and whatever else, um, I mean, the Russian critics who read the Nabokov clone text are already quite confused by it, but the Americans or English people who read this text are just going to not know what to make of it at all. So what I essentially did is a similar thing, whereas it turns out there are a lot of book blogs where people collect uh, Nabokov's favorite words. <laughs> and so I found a few of these lists and then I played the synonym game where I just sort of went through and said, okay, this can conceivably fit this word. and um, so that's sort of, I don't know, it's like it sugared the pill a bit because the, the Nabokov section is really, really weird in Blue Lard. And like critics like Bikov, for whatever his worth is, uh, <laughs> I actually like Bikov, but um, he, he really takes issue with, uh, with the Nabokov text because he just thinks it's a bad parody. Again, he's not parodying, but I think it's a good departure to sort of... Um, to use the Nabok of words. Um, then some other departures I took, uh, I guess when I'm rendering a section in dial and it's sort of in a, in a voice, like in the uh, stories you heard me read today, I don't mind, um, again, I'm not aiming for word for word parody. I'm aiming for the same meaning, but in a style. So there are chapters in Telluria, especially where you sort of have these uh, scas chapters from the perspectives of like factory workers in the future. Uh, and um, it, I just focused on creating a voice and, and read it aloud to myself a lot while I was going and didn't particularly, I mean, I worried about it. It's faithful in the sense that the sentences all mean the same thing, but there might be a contraction or a sort of plain spoken element to the speech where there isn't in the Russian, but also there are things you can't capture that Russian does. So you know, you kind of, um, for example, swearing, the Russian swearing can be much more inventive and, and create quite a bit more color um, than the English equivalent. So you might want to create color elsewhere in the sentence or paragraph because the, the swearing isn't exactly equivalent. So I guess those are all the things I've really tried to, I'm just trying to think of all the projects of, so, and then the one other probably point of interest, which um, will be on display in the, in Telluria is, Sarokin used um, uses a lot of faux old church Slavonic words. So like um, Nadovna, well Nadovna is not a great example, but it's uh, these sort of like archaicisms that are uh, don't exactly fit into the style of the text. And it's sort of this ideological game, like in Jena Prichnika or Devi Prichnik, when you have some characters who buy into the system and they're using these archaic little words and um, occasional expressions, but it's it's necessarily uneven because I think Sarokin would never say this directly and maybe I'm wrong, but um, I think his sort of thesis in, in rendering this game this way is that um, they are trying to be medieval but are not truly medieval. So it's just sort of like this badge of identification. So for example, working with Edwin Frank, the editor of NYRB, that was a conversation where he said, this is like not exactly written in medieval English, but there are these weird words that occasionally just crop up and I'm not sure exactly what to do with them. And I just said, take me on my word that, that it's sort of this game and it's meant to sound a little bit like a distortion and it's meant to sound a bit, not it's not meant to sound bad, like it, the sentences should still have a rhythm to them, but it's that there is this element of, um, I don't know, <laughs> try hard archaicisms where uh, it doesn't exactly doesn't exactly come off naturally and it would be a terrible in my opinion error to to render the dialogue just in, as entirely medieval or something because that would just 
it, the whole it's like uh the term Sorokin always uses is it's a vast vast built cyberpunk future so it's like imagine people in vast shoes in a gibson novel and then strip away a lot of the technology and blah 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 so yeah i think that's i think that's pretty much all the actually oh final thing i'll say and this is mostly because i um it was so on display in the stories today but i really think and this also comes from knowing Sorokin personally but i so i it could be a distortion but Sarokin is very connected to the ruralness of Russia and the rural traditions and the sorts of like down homeness of, of, of Russia as such, and feels a lot of connection to that. And also it comes out a lot in his writing. And I think you could miss that by seeing him just as this sort of like Russian Marquis de Sade prophet figure when actually he is very interested in sort of like Russian creature comforts too, which is of course a cr crazy paradox, <laughs> but, um, so I think the down home quality of the speech that comes out, I try to bring it out in my translations because I see it as something that you can really trace throughout almost all of uh, Sarokin's books. And I mean, Teluria, you've got a lot of peasant characters who, um, you know, they tell their narratives in their own voices, uh, Sugar Kremlin. Um, and in the early stories, you have certain peasant characters who crop up. I think particularly, I almost read The Tobacco Pouch. It's a great story, but just a little too long. Um, and, and there's a peasant character who has a magical tobacco pouch that uh, erupts into another one of these half gibberish, obscene narratives that uh, you can only barely keep track of. I should also say that I'm in front of one of Greg Clausen's, who's, who's in here, I believe. Uh, illustrations for dispatches from the district committee, which is the um, collection of Soviet stories coming out from Dalkey next year that I read. For, those two stories are from that collection. So it is technically exclusive content. Um, uh -huh. And Greg studied with Gerhard Richter. We started talking about their four hearts. Um, and I suggested that he try to do some illustrations of it. And it just planted a seed in his head, I guess, or laid eggs in his brain. And uh, he did a lot and off like 200 illustrations. And we um, hopefully are going to do a coffee table book at some point from Dalkey with like all the amazing stuff Greg has done. But we had to settle for about 40 really beautiful illustrations for Therefore Hearts, which I think um, Therefore Hearts is a very obscene book. It's like the second half of the binary bomb with no banal Soviet setup. But it's also very well structured and very tautly written and I think Greg's illustrations really helped to bring it home and his illustrations for the the Soviet collection of stories coming out next year are even crazier if you could imagine someone trying to illustrate uh the stories that I just read so I think that's all I have to say on the face of it and I look forward to questions <laughs> Thank you, Max. It's really fascinating to hear all the details about how the translation process is working. Um, so I'm sure there are lots of people who have questions. Just go ahead and raise your hand and I will um, unmute you or you can unmute yourself if you have some question. You can write in the chat box too if you're too shy to. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, please, David. Thank you. Good to see you, Max. Yeah, you too, David. One, wonderful to hear you reading the Sorokin stories. Um, so, uh, you know, I wanted to just ask about Therefore Hearts a little bit. Um, as, as you know, I read the first chapter of Therefore Hearts about 25 years ago when I was visiting Moscow and the first chapter had been translated and it was like nothing I'd ever read before. And I was uh, interested in reading it, but, you know, it's taken a quarter of a century since then. Um, but in many ways, this sort of renaissance is starting with his most extreme book. So, you know, even those who have read like Ice Trilogy and The Blizzard maybe aren't ready for Therefore Hearts. So I wanted to get your thoughts on um, bursting into the scene with Therefore Hearts. It's certainly going to set the agenda. Do you, do you think America's ready for Therefore Hearts and any reflections on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, David. Uh... I think the answer is yes, because um, I have a few reasons why I think the ordering of the books is good. Obviously part of it uh, is just how it shook out. And I, 
I don't really know why I translated their four hearts all the way through first, because after I'd started Blue Lard, Blue Lard's very complicated. And I said, let me just get a grasp of the more uh, basic idiom that Sorokin sometimes writes in. So I did their four hearts and I did a couple of novellas. But why I think that their four hearts and Tulluri is a very good pairing is one, I mean, without overplaying my hand about the Rush stuff, because I don't, I think, well, I mean, the occasionally violent nature of a uh, Russian state and the, you know, the brutality of what happens in Russia or the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation is I don't think a subject that is alien to what's happening today. <laughs> I mean, you could just click on CD CNN. And I think that, uh, so Sarokin is not, you know, writing, it's not like Giotta or Saad in the sense that Sarokin is really lamenting this stuff and he really hated the Soviet Union. And, and for him, it's, it's, it's a very sort of brutal parody that's also a real denunciation. So I guess he's trying to capture the essence of the Soviet Union as he did with the clones. And for him, the essence of the Soviet Union was this like totally aberrant, libidinally driven violence. And so I guess the, I think, yes, America's ready. One, because the bad stuff happening with Russia is still relevant. Um, to, uh, I think actually with the initial Sorokin launch, people had heard about how extreme he was, but were then sort of nonplussed when they read the Ice Trilogy. Not that it's not a good book, but it's just sort of like, um, you don't really, I think it's a good book to have read after you read a few other Sorokin books, because I don't think the nature of his project necessarily comes home if you haven't. Um, and so I think it'll be nice, is a funny word to use here, but I think it'll be nice for people to read There for Hearts and go, oh, this is why people are so pissed off about it. And um, three, I think with Telluria, it's a nice combination. I mean, David is my, uh, is a wonderful reader of uh, the things I share with you. You've also read Blue Lard and you know that Blue Lard is not exactly a picnic either. So I don't, <laughs> If for Sorokin's sort of early period uh, masterpieces, there's not really an easy way in because I think he's really dealing very sensitively in terms of his own sensitivities with the brutality of the Soviet experience. He's sensitive to it and his antennae, as he always loves to say, pick it up. That doesn't mean that it comes off as sensitive to the reader. It means that he's sort of dealing with what has rubbed him the wrong way. And um, yeah, but also Telluria is a good combo with it because Telluria, as far as Sorokin goes, is a very gentle book. Um, it's not to say that there aren't some bad parts, but it's um, it's a lot nicer than, than their four hearts. But yeah, that's a great question, David. My answer is yes, America is ready. <laughs> and England too, because it's, I think it's, it's coming out there as well. We have a, a question in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I could uh, read the second part. So the question is, well, first you of all, the freaking the students out. That's thank you. Uh, looking forward to seeing your translations and the freaking students out with them. Definitely um, hope that happens. My question, which lessons, if any, did you pull from Jamie Gambrell's translation and the French ones you mentioned you read? So yeah, um, the, the Jamie translations are really wonderful. And uh, I'm happy to be caring for the work she did. And the French ones, uh, a lot of the stuff was translated into French. And I often will, I will sometimes, not often, I'll sometimes refer to the French ones to see how they dealt with the problem that I'm dealing with and um, often do it differently, but sometimes do it in a similar way. Um, well, one of the lessons is just, um, I guess the Jamie translations, I think Jamie aimed for elegance over capturing every texture sometimes, which I think is a good method. And I think I sometimes go too far in the other direction. So I think I, in a certain respect, it's not what I learned from Jamie, it's what I, how I react against what Jamie did in a, in a certain way, which is just a normal sort of dialectical process of, you know, a uh, pretentious way to say that we all try to uh, build on what someone else has done in a different way and what the way we see it need, think it needs to be done. And I think Jamie, um, in particular, the thing that stands out is in Dave the Aprichnik doesn't do the archaicisms really. And I really did do that. Uh, I'm not sure if that's better or worse. I think some people would say it's worse because it reads oddly sometimes. 
Um, and um, I think that, yeah, so I think everyone does things in a different way. And, um, and uh, you know, I've, I've responded to Jamie's translations in a way. And I think there's a dialogue between our translations. And I'm, I'm grateful, very grateful to her translations because they allowed me to read Sorokin when I couldn't read Russian. I would also say that this is not true of Jamie's where I've never found a mistake, but I have found a couple of mistakes in the French translations, which is a little comforting because uh, Teluria went off to press yesterday. No, this, this morning, maybe yesterday morning, I forget. I think this morning. And um, that's a nightmare. That's a nightmare inducing situation. Once you can no longer change anything and you think, hope everything was perfect. But um, I have found a few mistakes in the French ones, which is, uh, slightly comforting as they're really wonderful uh, translations by Bernard Kaiser, who is friends with, I think friends with the Nabok of, uh, is what I've somehow heard. And um, Anne Colifi Focard, who really, really did an awesome job on Telluria, especially comes to mind. So the lessons, I guess that's a weird non-answer in a certain way, but I think probably it's that you read a translation and since every translation is necessarily an imperfect reflection of the original, you try to reflect a different part of it. And maybe that makes it worse and maybe that makes it better. So it's just, yeah. Um, the main difference though is probably the trying to do more with the textures, whatever result that might have. Then I got a question that came directly to me by accident and it says, what do you think happens in the omitted section of the second story you read? Oh, that is, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure I even, I mean, if anyone thinks they know what even happened in the part of the story I read, the second part, I would be, I would love <laughs> to know because I think um, obviously what Sorokin's doing there is dealing with um, textures of, of Soviet speech, this sort of like, slightly cloying Soviet elders advice, this sort of cliches, like what now would be boomer cliches, right? In the Soviet Union, what those, you know, wartime relative cliches would have been, but then combined with his aberrant uh, deconstruction of a sort of like production novel where you have this incomprehensible machine and what seems to be sort of like a body that's been reduced in some way to a material and like a bottle of sperm. So, I guess I'm thinking about it a little bit too much like a specialist, which is in the sense that I, I know what he's doing, but if I were to try to narrativize it, I think that probably it's, um, I actually, okay, I could actually think of a theory. I think that probably the woman he loved was necessary to the function of some machine. And then she had to be reduced to ashes in some way, but he continued to like uh, adore her and the, the attachment continued even at the point where she had to like fuel this steamship, it seems to me to be of some sort. Uh, there's another story that again, well, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, it's too long, but there's um, where someone, uh, a human penis has to be attached to uh, a, 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 an assembly line machine to make it work because it's the only way to make it work. So these sort of desacralizations and, and of the production novel, I think, you have to understand them partially in context is that the the production novel was this sort of horrible cliche that was shoved down their throats so desacralizing it was like a very refreshing way to uh take to live out as Sorokin says himself you want to live outside of the Soviet discourse because if I were to live inside of it I would have accepted it and I can't do that so by desacralizing it he's forcing himself to stay outside of it it's also just funny I mean, so and another question, in what ways do you think Sorokin's work has developed? Uh, aren't there any tropes in his work violence that keep cropping up? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, so as I was saying before, his work got a lot gentler um, in, in, a, in a certain way. I think um, so a lot the I keep using Bick as a punching bag, but that's OK. So Bick has this thing he says that he loves saying is, um, Sorokin didn't write a new book. He just wrote another book. Uh, and it's kind of not fair because <laughs> Sorokin's books are all so different. There is always a grain of Sorokin-ness you can identify in them, but they're not uh, just totally unchanging 
So for example, Sorokin's new novel is called Dr. Garin. Um, it hasn't been picked up yet. I hope it will. Um, I think it probably will soon because it's just wonderful. It's like a Dr. Zhivago for the 22nd century. Kind of. So it's like this love story that, uh, you know, you're passing through these um, landscapes ravaged by atom bombs and, um, and weird clones and parodies of rural life in the 19th century. But it's, all, it's written very warmly. There's not really much violence. I mean, it's not aberrant violence. It's, it's, very, it's, it's a very sweet and tender sort of epic that I think uh, you could give to almost anyone. I mean, no, that's not true. There's still a lot of poop and sex, but I think so. <laughs> the constants are probably the, the scatology never really goes away, but the violence really gets tempered down after Blue Lard. Blue Lard is the last book that I would say is really um, objectionable. And then after that, he, he kind of, I think, he just became sort of like a Russian sage in a sense. So uh, he likes, he, 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 he mellowed out as they say, but there are a lot of tropes that are similar throughout. I mean, you can refer to the work of various critics on how he's always dealing with the um, corporealization of uh, metaphors or discourses. So the machine at the end of the second story I read is a good example of this, right? It's, um, it's sort of like the awful coming to life of the fact that all these Soviet machines were built on people's ruined lives or something. I mean, that's sort of a trite way to read it, but there, there are better examples. For example, uh, the Dostoevsky clone story in Blue Lard, all the people try to sew themselves together and it fails miserably. So, which is sort of like a corporealization of uh, Dostoevsky's constant hungering for uh, togetherness and human unity and brotherhood. And in the Tolstoy story, hilariously, I mean, actually the, the, the corporealization in the stories in Blue Lard is very apt. In the Tolstoy story, they go hunting for bears and the, their dogs, their hunting dogs are just humans. And so it's sort of like this, uh, I think, dig at Tolstoy's, uh, I don't know, the fact that he was, you know, a, a noble of a certain caste who fancied himself to be this sort of, I don't know, <laughs> prophet. And then the Platonov story, hilariously, it's about, takes place on the steps and, and there's a train which runs on lumps of flesh called a lumpomotive. Um, so obviously, you know, this is sort of a very neat, um, neat corporealization of Platonov's ideas. And um, you can find that everywhere. So Sorokin's sort of operating on the level of the, 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 the lower part, the lower functions of the body and sort of trying to bring ideas down to the lower functions uh, as various critics have said. But I mean, yeah, so I think that, that answers that question for Steve. Um, why are geometric figures in lard such a constant presence in Sorokin's works? That's a great question, especially given the pus and lard thing. Um, what I would say to that is, well, first of all, it's not just lard. This is actually saying that gets a little lost in translation. Uh, so lard is sala, right? And sala is actually a delicious uh, food you eat. It's um, often served as these little like um, rolls of very thinly sliced lard, salted lard that is frozen and you eat it on rye bread and it's delicious. So I think that lard, that is again, uh, relates partially to Sarokin's love of like Russian culinary rituals. This is sort of a rural food. It's eaten most often in Ukraine, I think. Uh, people often will use it as a chaser when they drink. Um, but on the other hand, it's lard. It's, you know, it's animal rendered from a fat, uh, fat rendered from an animal. So it's, it's quite, gross if you think about what it actually is and there's something somewhat obscene about it in a certain way so I think it simultaneously references the sort of Russian down-homeness rural traditions that I claim are this sort of constant presence in Sorokin's works 
but also something horrible about it if you actually stop to think about it. There's an amazing story. And again, this is part of the reason why you can't keep collections intact. Um, we, uh, so Pierre Vysobotnik, uh, first working Saturday or first voluntary Saturday, as I was saying, we had to cut that up, but partially because three of the best stories from it, I mean, they're all great, but three of the best ones went to the NYRB greatest hits collection. And one of those is uh, an obelisk, which is uh, an amazing story. It's a, 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 a woman and her mother are on this bus in the country. And um, the, the, the mother suddenly remembers that, well, I don't, she just knows, I, that I don't, I think it's part of her plan all along, but she presents it as if it's the sudden impulse that her husband's grave is nearby and he died in the, in World War II in the Great Patriotic War. And she goes to the grave and says, you know, it's a very banal Soviet conversation. Oh, Mr. Bus driver, would you please wait for 10 minutes? We'll just be very quick. Of course, it's your, it's your husband's grave and he died fighting for Russia. Well, we'll wait for 15 minutes for you. And it's this yeah, very banal setup. And then the woman and her daughter rub lard all over the obelisk-shaped obelisk grave for like 10 pages, muttering these obscene incantations that are totally awful. But then it snaps back, which is funny too. And they go back to the bus and they say, so sorry, we took so long. And they like hobble back to their seats and, you know, a, a mujik in the back sort of snaps at them and they say, oh, it was for a soldier. He died fighting the Nazis. So uh, I guess, yes, lard is a constant, constant presence, just a light motif. It means a lot of things, um, but everyone should probably eat sala when they're, when they're reading Sorokin, S-A-L-O. Also, that's, again, you talk about untranslatability. There is an, uh, someone asked me this question when I was talking at a seminar at Harvard, and I had never thought of it, and I was kind of embarrassed, but obviously blue lard in Russian is called Goluboya sala. So Goluboy is also a slang word for gay, right? And then also salo, like the 120 days of Sodom. So there's a way in which like it blew lard, but also the gay salo, like the Pasolini film. So he's really, and, and that makes sense given the fact that in the in the book, Stalin, Hrushov, our lovers, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there are a lot of different kinds of levels he's playing at. That's a, a less important meaning of Salah, obviously, but everyone should eat it. And then the geometric figures is uh, Sarokin actually trained as an engineer. Um, and uh, so I think that's certainly part of it. Uh, he has a technical, technical mind and therefore hearts. There's an awful lot of uh, geometric, uh, there are a lot of machines that are described in, in enormous detail. And that's also true in the early Soviet stories and in Blue Lard. Um, I also think it has to do with the, um, again, the production novel, the sorts of things that were fetishized in the Soviet Union, right? Like everyone was obsessed with factories, which um, I think you could understate how, I, I mean, yeah, people were just obsessed with factories and production quotas. And, you know, a lot of popular movies were just about pr producing more in a factory and love stories in factories. So I think, uh, he's sort of um, rendering that cultural obsession through his own particular lens, which is partially influenced by training as an engineer. I also think there's just an element of humor in it. Again, I think uh, Sorokin's a serious writer, but he's also uh, just a wonderful satirist, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, David. I'll ask another one. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about Sorokin is, as well as his literature, his books, he's also written screenplays for films like uh, mm -hmm. Targets and uh, Four. And he's done, I think, opera librettos like What Was Happening with the Giant Paper Mache Toilet Outside the Bolshoi. Has there been any interest that you've seen in distributing those or translating the opera librettos or anything like that? Any of his non book type work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be, we would love to do that. Uh, the movies, I don't actually have a good answer for why Russian movies so often get caught in this weird sinkhole of distribution. Like you can almost never stream Russian movies, which is a very banal uh, answer to your question, but I, I don't know why that is. 
Um, but it's too bad, especially four is really good. You can watch Target actually on Amazon Prime, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Anyone who wants to watch Target, uh, it's on Amazon Prime. Um, and I think the Kopec is on YouTube with subtitles, um, which is a, another very funny movie. We would love to, I think we've talked about uh, a university press doing the complete plays, which I think would be the best sort of option for how this work would get done. I, would, I don't think anyone will publish the opera librettos for a long time. That's not a slight on them. It's just, I don't think really anyone's in the market for opera librettos at this point. I mean, maybe they are, maybe that's um, not true, but. Uh, and um, so we hope to do a complete collection of the plays and, you know, 50 years when he's hopefully been really canonized, hopefully, you know, we would love to have this stuff published by university press, but I think until then, I don't, I don't think anything with the plays will probably get published. I hope the films do get wider, wider distribution though, because they, especially four is really good. Um, even though that's kind of a funny story. Uh, when you watch four, you'll see it's kind of got a very uneven structure because the first half is very plot driven and dialogue driven. And the second half is <laughs> actually, believe it or not, uh, a bunch of elderly women naked rubbing themselves over with lard for a lo long time and making this bread doll. That's uh, like this voodoo thing. And um, it's the, the Dow, the infamous Dow director, Ilya Hershonovsky was making Sarokin's script. And there's a scene that's supposed to take place in the village and as happened, with Dow, I guess he got just, he, he, I think he described in an interview as he like, he melted away into the old women <laughs> as he put it. And so like the second half of the movie just became this giant obscene dinner scene and the, he didn't film the second half of the script. So Sarokin would really love it if the second half of the script got published, I think, because um, he was, I think he didn't know about it until he went to the press screen. <laughs> is my understanding, which is pretty funny. Um, I think there are a couple more in the chat box. Hi, Max, with Sorokin being indebted to the Russian literary tradition while subverting it, do you see him as part of that tradition or dissident to it? Mm -hmm. And do you see any young Russian writers for whom Sorokin has become the linchpin of that tradition? Great question. Um, so the first part is that I think Sorokin's maybe changed tack, changed perspectives a little bit here. I think if you'd asked him this question when he was 25, he would have said that he wants to destroy it and blow it up. And I think now he is, he, I've heard him say that he like rests his elbows on it. And it's, it's what he leans back on as he writes. And he literally corporealizes this metaphor because in his office, he's got a shelf of like, Polnia uh, Sabrania Sechinina, like, uh, like complete collections of Turgenev and, and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy that he literally leans his elbows back on as he writes. Um, so part of it is that he obviously is very indebted to it. He's subverting it, but like, you know, I don't think that there's anything subverting a tradition is no different from being a part of it and being indebted to it. I think the, the subversion is, uh, uh, is a necessary part of it. And if we look at, I mean, Gogol was a little bit too close to the origins for there to have been that much of a tradition for him to have been like leaning back on. But if we look at what Gogol was doing, it's not as if he was lionizing Russia as such or this. I think when we talk about literary traditions being subverted, we have this expectation maybe that the, the, the tradition has to be sort of like how we imagine war and peace maybe, right? Like war and peace, you read it and it has Russia is this great thing and you come away with it with this understanding of Russianness but if you read something like Dead Souls or Gogol's short stories, you come away with a profoundly ambivalent notion of what Russia is or what Russianness is. And I think, um, and the way Gogol uses language, everyone will say, oh, Tolstoy's Russian, so pure, so clean, so beautiful, Pushkin's Russian, blah, blah. But if you read Gogol's Russian, it's just deranged in, what, in an incredible way. So I think that maybe not, I think your question is great, but I think that I, the best, most, let's not say best, that's stupid. Um, uh, we don't need to evaluate things uh, rel relatively, but I think some of the most interesting 
authors from any given tradition are subverting the canon, even if it's very close to the beginning of the tradition. Um, and then for, yeah, I mean, for young Russian writers, um, there's one writer, um, Mikhail Lizarov, who is very controversial now because he's uh, become a nationalist who sort of interesting was sort of set to be um, next in line for the new Sorokin kind of, but abnegated that uh, role in a certain respect because his first collection, Fingernails or just Nails, Nogti, um, is a lot like uh, Sorokin's early stories. There's a wonderful story called Syphilis uh, about a, a secretary who reads Tiki Don and Quiet Fl Flows the Dawn and just gets syphilis from reading it, uh, which is a very Sorokinian story. Uh, but then he sort of, the interesting thing about Yudhisarov is that he both inhabits the Sorokin tradition and sort of inhabits his role as a nationalist, but also is ambivalent about both. So for example, the book that was translated by Andrew Bromfeld in 2015 or something, The Librarian is about these works of awful socialist realism that have magical powers. Um, and the people who read them get uh, filled with like this divine wrath or infinite wisdom. But the interesting thing is the books themselves are very bad and they form these libraries. That's this strange uh, network of, um, I don't know, warring cells. And then you find out at the end of the book that they're protecting the Russian motherland. But in fact, it's these like elderly women who have been brought back from the dead and, and it's very grotesquely described and they're defending the Russian motherland and they lock the protagonist in this featureless basement and they say like you have to read these books for all of eternity or Russia will fall so he's a nationalist but also seems to be profoundly ambivalent about what being a nationalist would be but on the but this is still create a rupture um, that means he is no longer uh, the young Sorokin as he had the opportunity to be perhaps um, his work is still worth reading and interesting and the librarian as I said before has been translated his new book Zimlia or Earth is like an 800 page uh, story about a guy in the in, in 90s in Russia in the 90s who works for his brother's gravestone business. <laughs> and it's just sort of this very slow, it's, it's kind of amazing in a weird way because even though he's a nationalist and like, oh, of course, Zimlia, like Earth, but, you know, blood and soil. But then on the other hand, it's a very stupid, horrible group of people who are rendered just very satirically in the same way that the characters in Dead Souls are. So very odd writer. I wouldn't say, so he definitely comes right out of stroke and you could probably tell from the plots I was saying, I'm sure there are others. I just, I'm a little bit lazy sometimes about finding, uh, there are a lot, I mean, there are a lot, but I think a lot of the writers who I've read who imitate Sorokin sort of a case of imitation being the most sincere form of flattery where Sorokin is very flattered, but I don't think anyone else is really getting a great deal out of it. I hope that there will be more writers who are influenced by Sorokin and come out of Sorokin as, as his stature grows. But I mean, there are a lot of young writers who, who want to be like Sorokin. I just don't think any of them have really produced much of value that I can think of. So, you know, I'm just one reader. And then another question, uh, yeah, thank you for the great question. Uh, do you ever find yourself having to come up with your own idioms in your translations? How much freedom does Sorokin give you to be a writer in his books? That's a great question. Um, so the answer is um, yes, for the first thing. I have to come up with idioms a lot because, well, this is actually sort of a, a funny situation with Sorokin in general is that he will often tell me not to translate things that need to be translated a little bit. So for example, in Therefore Hearts, I forget exactly the idiom, but I asked him what it meant. And he just said, oh, that's just the character's personal pun. And I said, well, <laughs> what does it mean? He said, I don't even know. So I just went, okay, well, I guess I have total freedom. And I just built it on the intonation. So whenever he does that, um, I, I feel quite liberated to, to think up my own, my own things. But, um, you know, sometimes he's more protective of it. And this is sort of something I was touching on before when I was talking about 
the difference between the norm and the latter a section of blue lard and telluria in that uh, when there's a very when there's a section that's strongly tied to a sense of place um, then you have to be a little bit more careful for example in um, want the section the famous section with the letters and the norm uh, there's a there's a part about uh, furniture, Soviet furniture, where I, I think I didn't really know what the furniture items were. And I was like, okay, we got to figure this out, you know, exactly what the equivalent was. And it has to do with there being sort of a run on this precise sort of furniture among upwardly mobile, not exactly Soviet people who were building dachas. And so it's like this highly specific thing that really needs a footnote. And I have to just get stuff like that right. But for the first part of Blue Lard, anything where he's working in the realm of fantasy, I can kind of go crazy. But when when he has a more specific thing in mind, I, I um, he's more careful and and more sort of not proprietary, but uh, he wants me to make sure I convey exactly what it is. And then, how much freedom does he give you to be a writer? Well. Again, I think it's, I'm always just following what he does and always just, you know, taking my cues from him. He does give me a lot of freedom to, um, to, he wants it to sound good. You know, this is a big problem with translations in general, especially when you're dealing with sort of a more, sometimes more academic notion of translation is that it's not about word for word equivalency. That's a good way to have a book no one will ever want to read. You have to sort of thread the needle of uh, faithfulness to the original, but it has to sound good and it has to have a consistent style and it has to, it has to work. And I think that he is excited that I am, that I start out from that position of wanting it to be its own thing. Like the Benjaminian idea of each translation is a parallel work of art uh, and blah, blah, blah. But I think that then sometimes we kind of work backwards and figure out what needs to be toned down. And I'm very grateful to all my readers. I think the Yelena and his Yelena Weissman, who's a wonderful editor, uh, and she also reads all my stuff and, and tells me when I've departed uh, from the original too, uh, too much. And um, I'm, you know, I really am grateful to all the people who take on that role for me. And, um, and uh, yeah, but I think I start out from the position of wanting wanting it to be a self-enclosed thing that you don't need footnotes for, that you don't need, that's not just a map to the original. And then sometimes we work backwards a little bit and, and, and go, okay, this maybe we could tone down or this should really refer directly to, to this object. So just a, a process of dialogue and you know uh, figuring out where you go too far. I have a kind of two part question if there aren't others right now. One that maybe goes in a slightly different direction. I'm curious, since, you, since you've basically been translating Sorokin for the kind of span of your time learning Russian and becoming like a you know, fluent Russian speaker or powerful wielder of the Russian language, <laughs> uh, how, like, how has your relationship with Sorokin shaped your relationship with Russian as a language and as mm. a you know speaker of Russian? And then since you also have written a novel, yeah. right? Like, how has your kind of immersion in, I mean, I, I can't, not being a translator myself, I can't really imagine what the process is of writing so much, you know, with your own words of what was written by somebody else, right? That, that kind of... Mm. I don't know, processing somebody else's writing in such an intimate way and mm -hmm. then going to write your own novel. So it seems like, you know, on mm -hmm. either side, both in your own writing in English and then in your kind of personal relationship with Russian, like Sorokin is there in the middle, yeah. perhaps. No, that's true. I mean, with the relationship with the language and the country, I mean, Sorokin looms so large in terms of like my, my first night in Russia ever, I had dinner with Sorokin. Um, it was, it was, um, I flew in and then we met and uh, had dinner and it was very surreal. And so I think he looms very large. My, whenever I'm reading any Russian novels, I'm sort of, I'm sort of thinking about him. And, 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 he, and when I, I'm sure when I write in Russian, I 
imitate his tics uh, or, you know, his little jokes. So I'm in Russian, I think I'm very infected by him. My, my intonations and speech sometimes, I think, even are a little bit influenced by him, which is uh, weird. But um, with the, with, and so it is, translating all that too has been, it's nice that we have a personal relationship as well, because I think it's sort of like an energy I tap into. And um, I know, or I shouldn't, this sounds, I shouldn't, I think I feel what he wants to say. And we kind of have this exchange of uh, energies that means that it's something I can tap into. And I'm, it's very familiar at this point. It's almost like a, a feeling or, um, cause you're right that it has been an awful lot of hours spent with his words. And then with my own stuff, I think Sorokin has been an incredible mentor, but fortunately it's just so different that there's never been any danger of like cross contamination. He's just more, I think he read uh, a short story I wrote. And the first thing he said is, thank God, this is very different from me. Like, uh, a bit worried and I, you know and it was just sort of like uh, a relief for him that it wasn't like me cribbing his style as they say grace do you, do you have a question yeah thank you so much for um being with us today i was just wondering if you could talk more about um translation decisions while working on these texts that you're particularly proud of and why um, sure um so I guess we're probably talking about bold decisions in the sense that uh, when, when you're translating a text that I always think there, there are things that just translate pretty well right out of the gate, like Kafka. I mean, this may be a crazy claim, but I feel like Kafka just translates very well. And translations of Kafka you read and you go, not, not really missing much. And I feel like the translators, I'm sure there are better and worse translations of Kafka, but uh, you know, I just think it translates well. I think the, the translations I'm most proud of are the ones where um, you kind of need to do something radical to make it come off well. So there's certain, like, Therefore Hearts was not particularly hard to translate. I think it just kind of came off well because it's the language is relatively simple and, and, and the sort of, I didn't have to make any giant leaps. So the things I tend to be the most proud of are like, um, I guess like the, the 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 old English chapter in Telluria, where the first time I did it, I didn't really understand that the endings were because I don't, to be honest, I don't know the feel of old Church Slavonic. Even I don't, I don't, I don't really know it. I, we didn't. It's not like at Harvard where everyone has to take the old Church Slavonic class. So I, these endings were mimicking old Church Slavonic endings, which Sorokin knows probably from going to church or, you know, just Russian people have that kind of feel for it. And I thought they were just meant to sound a bit like a golem creature. Um, and then I went back and I said, oh no, this is meant to sound like a weird old Church Slavonic. So I kind of had to rework it and um, find a new idiom. So I tend to be the most proud of moments like that where I think I, I have to think about it um, and, it doesn't come to me right away. And, um, and, you know, it's something that doesn't necessarily translate well. And that for, uh, this is another funny example in the second half of blue lard. Um, I really did not know how to, how to render how Soviet people talk. Cause if you've ever watched a Russian movie from like the forties or fifties, write a Russian novel from that era, um, you know, that Russian people from that era spoke in like a highly specific sort of idiom that's like, it's not exactly clear how you even characterize it. It's, it's sort of like highly formal, but also the jokes have a very specific style, the toasts, and it, it's just sort of like, and if you translate that straight into English, it sounds weird. <laughs> just sounds like vaguely direct. It sounds, you know, it kind of sounded like my first pass was a language textbook uh, because people are just kind of saying like, declarative statements with exclamation marks about everything and so what I kind of ended up doing was um, thinking about what might be an equivalent idiom and sort of settling on the style of dialogue in like movies from the 40s and 50s or like film noirs like a uh, dragnet where people are kind of talking with declarative tones more like this and they say well we're gonna have to go down there and sort of seemed roughly equivalent and I, I, I worked it over with that in mind. It suddenly didn't sound like a language textbook. So the, the things I'm always the most proud of are the things that might, might not translate well. 
not that Kafka is like, <laughs> it's funny, I use Kafka as an example. I'm sure maybe that's very hard to translate. It just seems to me that so when the language is relatively straightforward and there's nothing crazy, uh, you might, there's an easier road. But, um, but um, yeah, so I think that my, I'm, I'm most proud of the things that might be crashing failures and that I think of something I think fixes it. And maybe it's still a crashing failure, but I, I like it. <laughs> Uh, so let's imagine you're a producer with a multi-million budget. Which Sorokin book would you choose to adapt for the screen? And who would you hire to direct the movie? Um, wow, great question. I think probably Blue, Blue Lard uh, would be the one because the plot, you get three worlds. You get the, the futuristic Russian laboratory with the clones. You can film each of their stories and you could have like the, the narrator voiceover be in the style of the author. So for example, Dostoevsky's narrative voice is obviously characterized by a degree of repetition, re repetition of emphatic particles, um, a sort of a certain circularity. Uh, you know, he was dictating a lot of these novels late at night when he had massive debts. And so the Dostoevsky clone constantly repeats stuff and repeats words and will be, so he just pushed the nth degree. So like having this period drama about people trying to stitch themselves together with a narrator who's repeating certain words ad infinitum, I think would be very funny. And then obviously the, um, then to move to this weird world of like a nationalist parodying earth fuckers who, as their name suggests, copulate with the soil. Uh, and then to move to the alternate reality, uh, uh, Soviet Union, where, where the Soviet Union allied with Hitler and Hitler has hair down to his waist, which is just very funny. Um, and literally shoots electricity from his hands. Uh, that would be that would be the one I think. Um, but I mean, there are a lot of good uh, movies you can make of Sorokin book. Max, not really a question, but a comment. As you know, in the Soviet times, the best writers who could not get published with their own books used to translate books they read better and the translation than the original novels. You are making Sorokin better in some instances. Your translation is perfect. Well, Yelena, that's not true, but thank you so much for the kind words. I, um, I, I hope I make it as good sometimes, but um, the, I'm, I'm grateful too for the opportunity just to, to work with Sorokin. And, and it's been an amazing learning process because I think translating is like writing on a treadmill. So if you want to learn to write and you translate, it takes out the, the problems of inspiration or writer's block. And it just sort of becomes a whole, a whole process of um, what am I? It becomes sort of an issue of just the nuts and the bolts, and you learn how to how to deal with them. So I think uh, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity to do so much work for such a great writer because I think I learned from him. I don't think I made him better, but thank you, Yelena. That's very kind. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? seems like a good kind of stopping point. Um, thank you so much, Max. It's really just been so fascinating to hear all of the details of your process. And I'm so excited to read these translations um, and indeed to me. freak our students out with them yes. as possible. <laughs> the students will be freaked out, I think. I think, yeah, I think. I'll so. be amazed who will be, I know actually, Norman Skakov at Harvard is teaching my translation of Blue Lard right now to a class of, I think, like 40 oh. undergrads. Cool. Um, that could be wrong. That could be wrong. So that, I'm, that book's crazy. <laughs> so That's very cool. It'll be exciting to hear what they, what they have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, Helen. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. thank you so much for coming. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah.